will do a sort of an overall and I think pretty important um, introductory talk tonight on the Arthurian myth, which deal with really the, the nature of the myth and what it does. And that if all is well, the next uh, Friday we will deal with the various details of the Arthurian myth itself, the round table, the various knights, all that sort of thing. That we we uh, we have a little more time to deal with the with the subject matter. Uh, so that being the case, uh, I was uh, giving some thought as to what. What overall characterization could one give to uh, a myth such as the Arthurian cycle of myths? Uh, what, what would be an accurate description? And so in a somewhat uh, Jungian way, even though the, the terms are much, much older than, than Jung, uh, I came up with the idea that uh, what we are dealing with here is an, uh, a very specific archetypal myth. Now, uh, that needs a little bit of explanation about archetype. Arche, you know, means something old. Uh, and typos uh, means uh, a subject. Uh, so uh, what we are dealing with is an, an old image, is an archetypal image or just an archetype is, is a, an ancient image also. Now, that being the case, uh, I thought I will do a little bit of exploring today, and I, uh, owing to my uh, condition, I'm not sure uh, whether I'll cut the talk shorter or not, but that all depends on the situation and on the inspiration. So uh, uh, I thought that we'll, we'll try to uh, uh, analyze uh, the, uh, the principal figure and consequently the principal theme of the Arthurian cycle uh, in terms of the archetypal uh, nature, the archetypal significance of the uh, central figure. Now, uh, you know how it is with old people, uh, one always reminisces, one is reminiscing. So I'm reminiscing about the first time that I became aware of the figure of uh, King Arthur. And I was in uh, the city of Innsbruck in the Tyrol in Austria where I was going to school. And they have a very interesting uh, 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 establishment there, all, along with others. Uh, it, it's a, a chapel which is round, and it's part of the imperial palace where the emperors sometimes, when they didn't, they got tired of eating Wiener Schnitzel in Vienna, and then they came to Innsbruck, uh, used to live. But this, the circular chapel is. Uh, actually a burial ground of one of the early Habsburg emperors, Maximilian I, uh, who, was, who had the, the popular title as the last knight. In, not in terms of a knight to go to sleep, but a knight with the sword. And uh, the last Ritter. In any event, so it's a very beautiful uh, place. And in the middle is a large, dark, I think, bronze catafalque uh, of, the, of, of Maximilian with his, uh, uh, him lying down uh, on, on top of the coffin or, or a pedestal. And then there stand, I think, 12 huge, uh, bigger than life-sized black statues. Again, I think mostly uh, uh, built of some black material around. And the, the Innsbruckers call it in, in their, uh, uh, in their uh, local lingo, the Schwarzen Mandeln, 
the, the black fellows, the, the black guys, all these things around. And each one of them has some description, his name and so as to who he is. And these are all important mythic figures which in one way or the other, sometimes by actual family relation and sometimes uh, in an ideal sense, can be said to be linked with the Emperor Maximilian who is buried in the center. So I went around and looked at the black fellows standing there, big, massive black bronze statues, very nicely executed, and uh, among them, I saw one with a plaque underneath it, Arturus Rex, Arthur the King. And then somewhere further on, then there was a little description, I don't remember exactly where it was, uh, saying that, uh, uh, let's see if I can remember the Latin, uh, the Latin phrase, uh, uh, Arturus Rex. Rex que quondam futurus. Arthur the king, the, the, of, of uh, the past and of the future. So the way that is often translated into English, Arthur the once and future king, which of course has to do with his story. So um, I thought, well, this is interesting. I knew a little bit about the Arthurian myth by that time, but immediately, not very far from there, is the Innsbruck City Library. And so I hot-footed it over there and looked up all kinds of things about Arthur, uh, uh, Arthur, the, the once and future king. So I thought, well, we, we have really an unusual uh, archetype here. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a legendary figure uh, whose fame uh, manifested itself for many centuries. I, I didn't have the uh, opportunity or the, to, uh, uh, you know, you all have your little magic boxes <laughs> and you can look up anything there. You know, it's, a, it's a little bit like... Uh, 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 Edward Kelly and Dr. D, the two magicians at a somewhat later period, at the time of Rudolf II, who uh, 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 they they had a magic box. Now this is this is going way back in the Renaissance times, uh, and uh, on this on this magic box, when they did the proper magic, there would appear a little figure, a little woman, in fact and she would give them information. This was uh, Dr. Kelly's and, uh, and uh, his friend's uh, uh, source of information. Well, you have those kinds of things now of, of a different sort, but I don't, and not only that, but I, uh, I really don't like them, you know. I, I like to look up my information either in my own increasingly failing memory uh, or uh, in a book, library, or, or something of that sort. In any event, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issue that we are dealing with is that uh, we, we, deal here, we are dealing here with this legendary figure uh, who probably more than almost anyone else in European history uh, with the exception probably of Jesus Christ, uh, had maintained himself in, in the public interest for the longest period of time. Century after century went on, and King Arthur and the story of his knights and the round table and all the various details were still always there with some new additions given to them, so that the legend, the myth, grew and grew and grew. And that sort of thing doesn't happen very often. So um, I reached the conclusion, uh, at least uh, uh, for the time being, that what we are dealing with here is a very, uh, a very unusual figure. We are certainly not dealing, even though there may be, as there often is, some... Uh, historical uh, elements 
Namely, that there was somebody, a, a tribal chief or a kind of a big tribal chief in the British Islands whose name was Arthur. Uh, so there was that sort of a, a historical foundation. But then everything else is just a burgeoning, growing, bubbling uh, uh, mythology which goes on and on with many, many figures and which is extremely interesting and extremely instructive. So, um, uh, ancient image, archetype, I am not really sure at the moment, but I am almost sure that uh, the first uh, person who uh, uh, made that term popular an archetypus, an ancient image uh, in the ancient world, was Philo, uh, Ju known as Philo Judeus, or Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jewish philosopher and historian, and a, a very, uh, uh, very famous man in his own day, and who uh, uh, came up with the idea that. Uh, the human humanity has certain uh, ancient images which go way, way back to the early history of the human race. And that these images uh, have certain characteristics. And as time goes on, there are uh, tales, uh, myths, uh, poems uh, uh, that are being written about these people or about these images, so that these images are an active inspiration for the imagination of people and, uh, and thereby, you know, interesting tales are uh, uh, being uh, constructed. Uh, Philo, uh, incidentally, uh, was also the, the first one who um, uh, very extensively mentioned the, the divine Sophia. Here he was, a Jewish fellow, you know, practicing Jew in Alexandria, the city of Alexandria had a very large Jewish population. I guess it, then and now, they didn't want to live back in Palestine, there were too many, too many Arabs and too much warfare, and so they moved to Alexandria where also the business was better, you know, obviously. So he, he came up with the, the double myth of uh, the Logos and Sophia, the Word of God, whom the Christians then identified with Jesus Christ, and uh, the, the wisdom which he conceived of as feminine. He wrote very extensively and very beautifully about both. So, in a sense, when we are talking about Sophia, or when we use the, uh, the uh, appellation of Logos for Christ, then we are really following in the footstep of uh, Philo, a uh, very, uh, very interesting and very wise man. So, in any event, uh, Philo also came up with the notion of ancient images, and he said that uh, the humans in their mind uh, have uh, certain themes, certain images which are there. And they uh, bring these up from time to time and then they construct new stories, new myths, new histories around them. But that the images the, Im the ancient images, the reason that they are so ancient is because they are always there in the human mind and they bring them up from time to time. Now, as you might readily imagine, since he was dealing with such things, uh, the person who dug up that term and made it uh, quite important in uh, modern psychology and also elsewhere was C.G. Jung, archetype. Uh, and uh, so I think it's quite uh, evident to me that both in the ancient definition, like Philo's, and the modern de definition, like Jung's, the, uh, uh, the idea of ancient images which are sort of there in humanity's uh, 
unconscious, to use the psychological term, and which then are brought out, and then stories, uh, myths, uh, poems are made by about them by imaginative uh, literary people. And so that, that is the sort of thing that we are dealing with in this strange figure of uh, uh, the once and future king who in our uh, particular rendition bore the name of Arthur. Now, uh, I need to uh, jump a little bit back because before we uh, go to the once and future king uh, with, with those adjectives, maybe if we just look at it in a more uh, on, uh, uh, um, on complicated manner, and we just say that the, the very nature of kingship, the idea of king itself is an archetype and that it was certainly treated as such. So first we have the archetype of the king, and then we have the archetype of the once and future king. So uh, let's look at the, the, the one of the king first. Now, um, uh, so uh, we need to keep in mind that if we are accepting this terminology, then we need to uh, keep in mind that archetypes exist uh, not just in history, but they exist, well, Jung would see the psyche, psyche, which is Greek for soul, in the soul of humanity. And therefore they come forth maybe in va different variations from time to time. So uh, uh, as if archetypes exist not just in history, but in the soul, uh, uh, then, we, then we kind of know where to look for them. So um, the archetype of kingship is a very extensive one and really a very important one. I know that we live in an era of history when, uh, let's say, uh, there are not as many kings around in the world as they used to be. <laughs> I think it was the late King Farouk, who incidentally is often very badly misjudged. He saved the life of uh, my mother's cousin, who uh, spent a lot of time in Egypt. Uh, uh, Rati Almashi was a great uh, disciple of Bishop Mikesh, uh, our friend, and so forth. So, uh, uh, um, I mean, you know, we, uh, King Farouk said in a sort of a, a self-deprecating jest, he said, another uh, hundred years from now, there are, go there are only, only going to be, uh, let's see, how did he put it? Only going to be uh, five kings. They are going to be the king of England and the four kings in the deck of cards. See, Farouk had, a, Farouk had a good sense of humor. Mm. Uh, so uh, it's not exactly true because, uh, thank God, there are more kings than that around. But uh, it was ne nevertheless a somewhat of a prophetic uh, statement. So um, now what we need to remember that the, uh, let's say, the archetype of kingship, if we can call it that, is... Uh, a uh, transcendental uh, uh, function, or that it is closely related to what in the depth psychology we often call the transcendent function, and it is, it is not primarily a political function. In fact, when we look back to ancient times, the, uh, the sovereign leaders of various nations were uh, uh, not primarily political figures. Well, maybe, you know, they, they, they ran the country, too, but they were, regard, they were spiritual fig figures. Uh, and uh, this continued right up to uh, comparatively recent times in some countries. The, uh, the uh, characteristic is uh, brought out of, of the, the king, having a 
that the king's authority, the divine right of kings, as it is called, comes from the divine. So that there is a transcendental element there. And if you uh, have uh, watched at all or have been otherwise informed, for instance, about the coronation right of uh, the new king of England, you will have seen it as a solely religious function with anointings, with the crown, with many, many prayers, with a whole bunch of clergy falling all each over, each, each one over the other, and things of that sort, and it is done in a historical church. Uh, and that, to a greater or lesser extent, in some countries it has been kind of cut down, but that is the, uh, the ancient custom. Now, uh, that indicates that the uh, archetype of the king comes from uh, a spiritual place, and uh, that is, there's some spiritual realizations that people had in, often in the distant, distant past that was... Uh, uh, and that is being applied in those few places where there is still uh, a king. Or like in Japan, an emperor. You know? uh, I remember, uh, I don't know what document uh, I was see reading, uh, but uh, I, I think it, uh, it, it, it had something to do with World War II. When Emperor Hirohito issued uh, a big document to his people, you know, and said, very, uh, very archetypal, you know, we, Hirohito, by the, by the grace of heaven, the Tenno, are, uh, are addressing ourselves to our faithful subjects. And then, while seated on the throne of a line unbroken for ages unnumbered, now, I haven't heard anything so archetypal in a long time. The line unbroken, uh, age is unnumbered. What, a, what an archetypal representation of uh, family tradition. Uh, in any event, uh, and of course something like the, like the Tenno, uh, the, the Japanese emperor has a very important religious function because he is uh, by by his office, he is the supreme head of the Shinto religion. And most of the high priests, high priestesses of the Shinto are all imperial, of the imperial family. So, uh, uh, it, it, you, know, you can see that there is a strong spiritual connection. Now then, or right, that's just one. So now, uh, uh, we are dealing with, uh, with a, a mythos, we are dealing on ar an archetype here that is certainly uh, much, much greater, much more profound, and so has been treated as such by people, than merely a, an executive administrator of a country. So uh, let's say, let's start at the top, with the, uh, speaking of religious function, one of the very important uh, titles in, uh, certainly in the Roman Catholic mythos, I think in Orthodoxy too, is Christ the King, one, one of the many titles. So Christ is regarded as a king, and many of the great icons of Christ, he wears a crown, so that is like, before Christ the King, there were already the, not terribly far from where he was, there were the, uh, the kings of Egypt, actually of Upper and Lower Egypt, the pharaohs, who were regarded by their uh, office, uh, em embodiments or overshadowings of the gods, particularly uh, of certain gods. Uh, so, is Christ the King. And when we look at the great uh, figures, avatars, in, as the Hindus would call them, Buddhas, as they would be called in Buddhism and others, of some of the world's great religions, 
we find that they all have a, a royal aspect. For instance, uh, uh, Krishna is, uh, of course, Krishna is embodied, he's, he's actually the charioteer of the king, the king being Arjuna. Uh, so that's of, of the Hindu uh, avatars. Uh, Gautama, uh, the Buddha, who becomes the Buddha, is a royal prince. His, his uh, father is a, a, a Maharaja, great, which means, Raja means king, Maha means big. <laughs> so, great king in what is now northern India. Uh, uh, the other great avatar besides Krishna uh, is Rama, and Rama is a king. And he, he, he commands this vast uh, uh, campaign where they are capturing what is now called Ceylon because the, the king Ravana, the, the nasty king of Ceylon, had kidnapped, uh, uh, had, uh, had kidnapped Rama's uh, 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 betrothed uh, girlfriend. And so they make this great big campaign because, you know, Ceylon is an island off in India. And then they, what I hope is loved, loved about that campaign, that is the Ramayana, the story of Rama. And uh, uh, is, is the one that, uh, you know, how are they going to get all those troops over from India to, to uh, Ceylon? or as it is now called Sri Lanka. I think the ancient is of Sri Lanka. Well, uh, uh, Rama has a, a, a trusty friend who is a monkey. And the monkey gathers helpers, other monkeys, and even a bunch of uh, sort of little chipmunk-like creatures, and they with their teeth and things, they cut the wood and they make a bridge from India to Ceylon. And their Rama's troops are able to march over. A pretty, re pretty resourceful bunch of creatures, <laughs> you know, uh, um, in order to rescue Sita, who then becomes his wife. Uh, um, and of course, we know that uh, the early Japanese and Chinese emperors all are Actually, the, the mythos is assigned to them that they descend from the gods. Uh, so uh, I could go on and on, but let's say that kingship, therefore, the archetype of kingship is the manifestation of uh, uh, a divine direction. Somebody who is at the top of the pyramid of society, but who can, from that position, commune with the other world. And that, that's what the kings really were uh, to begin with. And then later on, of course, various uh, changes occur. So it is the kingship as a manifestation of uh, uh, divine direction. Because even as a, a country or a people may have its king, uh, it is assumed that by the order of the cosmos, the world, the, the cosmos, the star, the moon, sun and moon and the stars and those, they all also have their king. So that there is a, a spiritual or transcendental royalty that needs to be taken into account. And that's not such a bad idea. Uh, so then uh, uh, now... Uh, this is the kingship as a manifestation of the, the divine direction. The remnant of that was a right probably till the present time, but certainly at comparatively recently in a lot of country. I know in my native country, Hungary, the king of Hungary was always regarded as king by the grace of God. So let's say our last, who was our last king, but hopefully will not always be, uh, Charles the Blessed, who has been declared uh, almost a saint uh, by Pope John Paul. Uh, he 
he was, you know, his solemn title would have, would have been Charles the Fourth by the grace of God, Apostolic King of Hungary. So um, there is the relationship of kingship to the transcendental dimension. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, we maybe need to ask ourselves, since we are people in this particular age, and we have various theories and various uh, uh, various uh, uh, nomenclatures uh, that exist in the culture, uh, where, uh, let's say, the, where does this, this uh, idea of a transcendental kingship come from? Well, um, we obviously have no, uh, no factual information to that effect, but let us say it is my conviction that this, the celestial, the transcendental, the angelic powers, which uh, in, uh, in other cultures, like among the Greeks, among the Egyptians, among the Romans, were regarded the gods and the goddesses, that these, uh, um, these persons were regarded as, uh, let's say, bearing a spiritual or transcendental royalty. And uh, I would say that that is a very beautiful and uh, ultimately, I think, uh, spiritually very true idea. We need to recognize that uh, uh, our lives are not just uh, commanded by our ego, by our personality, but there are deeper powers. And some of these may be envisioned as uh, royal, transcendental royalty, spiritual royalty. And uh, that is, uh, that is a rather, rather a helpful, more than an unhelpful concept. So, um, in modern terms, with modern psychology, uh, since Sigmund Freud, since uh, Carl Jung, uh, of course we can say that in a psychological explanation, what we are dealing with here is that the archetypes are in the psyche, in the psyche of the individual, in the psyche of the collective, so that uh, we have an interior relationship to the archetype of kingship. And uh, I'll mention before, because this, I think, has a profound relevance to uh, the kind of archetype like Arthur, the once and future king. So it's in the, where is, uh, where do the archetypes exist? Is there some special place? Uh, a secret island in the South Sea, which is the archetypal island? No, not that. But it exists, they exist in the psyche. For which reason, with, with variations, all humans have access to these archetypes. Now, uh, I think that that is probably enough of a theory about uh, the archetype of kingship. Now, uh, now I'll add something to it. What about the uh, adjectives that you have uh, attributed, for instance, to Arthur, and that I saw there in the chapel with the black men, namely uh, the once and future king? Uh, so uh, what is that? What kind of an archetype is that? Well, now you have a... a an issue which is uh, not very easy to approach, but uh, you guessed it, I'll approach it just the same. <laughs> uh, uh, and that has, uh, it has to do with the fact that there is an, an underlying uh, ancient uh, recognition, an ancient myth to the effect that uh, there was a time when uh, there was a divine king on earth. And in reality, if you uh, 
want to translate that into psychological terms, it means that within our own little kingdom, mine and yours and yours, there was a time where, where it was different from the present one. And when the great archetypes, Christ the King, the other kings, the, the sacred king, walked the earth, so that we have a, a dim uh, psycho-spiritual memory of uh, a spiritually inspired kingship in ourselves, in, in this kingdom that we have, that there was a time out of time and out of place when we had access to uh, spiritual guidance, spiritual direction, spiritual wisdom. The Greeks would have said that was the time of the, the Olympians, the gods and the goddesses. And we can give them all kinds of names. But the fact of the matter is that we have a, a, a dim memory, which however can be made perhaps less dim, that there was a time when the gods and the goddesses walked among humans and when they gave us direction. And uh, since that happened once, maybe it can happen again. <laughs> so here is the once and future king. So we, we, have, a, we have a memory of a great uh, transcendental spiritual beings who uh, walk the earth and who uh, organize things here in a, in a much better fashion perhaps than they are organized now and that these need to be remembered and that is the wants of the kingdom but there is also the future of the kingdom and if you look into the, the prophecies of the second coming of Christ of uh, various Buddhas and so forth again the uh, I would say the expectation of uh, the great reality that has been here once returning again and shedding its directions and blessing on us is practically universal. You can find it among the most, uh, we used to call primitive tribes, or I don't know, some, some tribes in Siberia, or among the, the, the shamans uh, in various places and so, and they, they all will have a tradition that yes, there was a time when the divine kings walked the earth and directed human affairs, and that since it has been once, it may happen again. So I think that uh, I already uh, hinted enough now indicating that at least in my view, especially when you consider the vast uh, amount of uh, written material that exists about Arthur, the once and future king, that uh, the, uh, the Arthurian myth has, was, and uh, to the extent that people are interested in it, is a, a, a revival of that idea. Yes, there was a time when the, the good, the wise, the holy beings of uh, transcendence were here and walked the earth and they helped humans and they gave them laws. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the most frequent uh, mythology about uh, sacred scriptures and laws being given to humanity are not that there is a, an old guy named Moses who climbs up a mountain and there out of the bush God jumps and, uh, and gives him uh, uh, commandments and things, but that uh, people have within themselves the capacity to uh, commune with transcendence and that some people probably more so and that therefore the, the prophets and the kings 
were also the same. People who are able to interact with the other world and receive inspiration and command uh, and, uh, and maybe commandment from there. So that therefore, what we are confronted here with in the image of the once and future king, uh, if I can sort of mythologize it a little bit myself, once there was a king. A king who was divine, a Christ the king, who came from the, uh, from the high heavens and who came in order to uh, help the people who are here and uh, to establish a situation wherein people would be happier, wherein, where people would be uh, more, uh, more in touch with their own indwelling spirit and with the spiritual worlds in general. In other words, where the, there would be an unobstructed universe within which people are able to move their consciousness from just here on earth to higher and more transcendental regions and receive inspiration from there and receive uh, guidance from there. And that this is the uh, origin of the divine kings. Now, uh, I think that is a perfectly uh, plausible psycho-spiritual idea. Uh, and that is really the, 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 the archetype of the once and future king. Once there was a good, just, godly king, and then something happened. Uh, something happened. He was no longer there. And uh, uh, yet, uh, people believe in the kingdom and you find in the New Testament almost innumerable references of the kingdom. Of course, Jesus also said, my kingdom is not of this world, and there are all kinds of uh, variations. But the issue being that there is a realm of kingdom, well, a, a realm of consciousness, a, a, a reality where, which belongs to the transcendental principle of rulership, and that we being human, being children of, let's say, that kingdom, we have, uh, we have access to it. If, we, li if we, we live rightly, if we think rightly, if we uh, uh, move our consciousness in such a way that we are uh, close to that kingdom, then that kingdom will manifest to us and in us. But if we ignore it and we, uh, we only uh, want to follow the mundane uh, arrangements, the politics that come out of, uh, uh, of the parliaments and, uh, and of the, the, the Congress and of the Senate, if that is our reality, if that is our rulership, if we don't recognize a, a rulership superior to that, wiser than that, more moral than that, then we are in a doggone poor situation. Because if there is nothing higher than these uh, corrupt uh, worldly governments, and then, uh, my gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very bad situation that we find ourselves in. But let us say the universal traditions of humanity indicate that there is more. But we have to acquire the, uh, the means whereby to interact with it. It's just like, uh, oh, I don't know, in, in, in a place where there is a a king or an emperor or something like that, you, know, you, can't, you can't just walk into the emperor's bedchamber uh, because there are guards and there are various officials. And in the same way, if we, uh, we cultivate the spiritual life and the spiritual beings that exist in the higher worlds, then we have entrance to that world. So when, you, when we appear... Uh, in that doorway, uh, 
uh, of the other world, instead of uh, shutting the door in our face, uh, they will look out at us. I mean, these are, of course, uh, uh, similes. They will look at us, at us and say, well, come on in, brother. Hey, we've been, we've been looking for you, you know. And it's actually not that far-fetched mm -hmm. to use these uh, uh, similes. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it, it, the, in, the, the ancient uh, uh, hymns, for instance, about, about the dead, Dies ire, dies illa, again, the Rex Tremende Majestatis, O oh, oh thou King of Tremendous Majesty, you know, come to us and raise the dead. So uh, the, uh, the archetype of kingship is, is present. Now then, with all of this uh, beating around the bush, you know, what, what do I really mean? I think I mean that uh, ancient humanity, whether in the British Isles or anywhere else, uh, had a, a, a collective memory over time when uh, really the, the kingdom of God was here on earth. And, and they said, well, the, the, the gods walked the earth and they, they, were, they, they were the first kings. This is, of course, the Egyptian belief. So uh, there is a, a buried and yet not dead memory that there was a time when the great transcendental beings, and I don't mean beings from Mars or, from, or who jumped off a flying saucer or something of that sort, but uh, from, other, uh, from other spiritual place, other spiritual dimension, and yet collected with this one, who were here and who helped and who uh, guided humanity and who... Uh, uh, were really uh, our spiritual kings. Now, on the other hand, uh, as we already indicated, then the next portentous and indeed sad question is, if such was the case, what happened to it? Why is it gone? Why, why doesn't it exist anymore? Well, there, there's the rub. And... Uh, I don't think I'll be able to give you a quick answer on that. But nevertheless, they constructed myths where there was a very outstanding, very sacred, very wise, and really very uh, holy uh, ruler. And uh, then something happened and he went away. Mm -hmm. Maybe... Like Arthur, he, they, he seemingly died, mm -hmm. and they took his body to the Isle of Avalon, where he still rests. But, and this is the, this is the clincher, he is coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Sec whether we are talking about second coming of Christ or, or any of the others, the issue being there is a, a, a wisdom, a goodness, uh, uh, a, uh, spirit, a spiritual skill that was once here on earth and then became obscured and buried in when we but it 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 will come back and uh, if you uh, should ask me uh, and I'll answer it without you asking as to how this relates to the Arthurian myth because that is precisely the figure of Arthur, the, one, the once and future king. That once there was a great king who was, he came from a mysterious realm. And we, we, we look at some of the stories, I hope, uh, especially if I feel a little bit stronger than I do right now, uh, that relate to uh, Arthur's birth, Arthur's childhood, the subsequent life and so forth, that really, uh, he was a magical creature. He was, uh, his, his very conception in the story uh, is magical, because it is uh, Merlin, the great magician, who 
wants Arthur to be born over particular parents. And so he arranges the situation by magic. Arthur, we'll talk about that maybe next time. Arthur is conceived and born. And, uh, and after that, so for a long, long time, Merlin is always there. I sort of envision him on the basis of the various Arthurian stories that when you are in uh, one of the castles of King Arthur, uh, about all you have to do is step outside and look around a little bit, walk into the, uh, uh, walk into the edge of the forest, and there is Merlin. And he, Merlin will tell you what to do, Merlin will inspire you, Merlin will help you. Now, of course, the way these myths develop, there are many, many details, there are many uh, different keynotes and so forth, and uh, we, we are not going to do it, but we could, uh, we could spend the entire remaining year and then some, uh, even until the great, horrible, archetypal event of the election of the President of the United States. We're all, we're all shaking just thinking about it. Uh, you know, even, even then past, we always bear, however, we, uh, we have the capacity to, uh, inside of us, uh, call to mind that uh, this kind of a condition exists and that if we are in tune with the, with the uh, once and future king, then it is not going to be only a once king, but it will be the future king, that we can actually uh, be agencies, agents of a restoration uh, to restore the kingdom to restore the kingdom of God, as the New Testament might say it. And in so doing, what, is, what good is a kingdom without a king? So that obviously there would be great beings there, and maybe one particular one, who would be the, the, the guiding uh, agency of the age. And I think this, these things are important uh, to remember, because... Uh, in our uh, history, both in many places, we have become uh, neglectful of uh, a particular circumstance. We have misconstrued a situation. And you know what that is? That is that uh, it always it, it takes two to tango, as the, the story has it. And in this case, the two are the below and the above. Uh, that which that which has been and that which shall be, and uh, we we have neglected that. We said, oh well, yeah, well one time we had a king, and uh, then we got a president. You know, uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion. Interestingly enough, it sort of indicates too that the. Uh, People were in touch with these deeper, mysterious, archetypal realities in all ages in various ways. That uh, um, uh, George Washington was uh, intended by the, ma by the majority of the founding fathers to be made an elected prince. And his title would have been His Serene Highness. Absolutely true. They try to hide it away, but it is true. Now, what does, what does, of course, you know, there have been elective, elected princes. You know that the Holy Roman Emperors, the successors of Charlemagne, uh, were elected by other, by the, by the electors, the prince electors in, in, in Germany. So, um, that's how uh, even one of the Hungarian kings, who was Hungarian king first, King, S king Sigismund, who was of the House of Luxembourg, he was Hungarian king first, and then he became Holy Roman Emperor later. Uh, so the, the issue being that, and, you know, was the, the main elected prince in, in old Europe, in the doge of the, of the state of Venice. The, 
the head of the of the Scarlet Council of the of the ruling uh, men of Venice was always elected by the by the council, but the council members themselves had links to the people. So uh, and to this day, you know, right now, I, I don't even like the one who is uh, on that throne at the present time. But that's my problem. I don't think he cares. You know who is an elected prince? The Pope. The Pope is elected by the conclave of the of, of the cardinals, uh, and uh, so there is there is an elective monarchy, which is the monarchy of the Catholic Church. And the Orthodox Church, like the Ecumenical Patriarch and what that thing is, the other bishops, uh, uh, synod synod elects them. So these are all they are elected. But once they are elected, they carry a transcendental power. So uh, I think what what we are dealing with here now that really the the we we can if we want to probably not not, not everybody wants to but we can if we want to uh, sort of uh, do a little uh, conjuring conjure in our minds the time when the, the sacred king ruled the earth and uh, then uh, try to see if uh, some of that can be brought back because life on earth needs to be one to term for it would be sacralized mm -hmm. there is uh, there is altogether too much secularism you know, when it comes right down to it, uh, I don't know, it's not a very good expression, uh, but let us say, when, when we really look at it from a spiritual point of view in, in depth, the, uh, the uh, humanity is, uh, is sacred. And the leadership of humanity ought to be sacred also. When the connection, the conscious connection, because the unconscious connection will always be, the conscious connection with the, the transcendental dimension wears off and it's lost. That is the time when Arthur's body is taken to the island of Avalon and where he's buried, but where it is understood that he's going to come back. So uh, this is a very, very important archetype, that there is, there is something missing in our world. Well, I think that if you were, were very honest and very loquacious about it, you could, uh, you could regale us with hundreds of things that are missing. Maybe beginning with uh, your diminished bank account, <laughs> but uh, but there is there is something missing, and uh, and what is missing is the presence of the uh, the directive, the wise sacred. Now that that's it, and when that is absent, then the uh, the king who was once, is no longer here. And so it is really part of our uh, job to uh, bring Arthur, or whoever we, we want to call him, bring the, uh, the, ones, the one who was once king and make him the future king again. And that is done, where is it done? Is it done in Washington? Is it done in London? Well, maybe a little bit of it here and there. It's done right here. If we, uh, if we look for our interior king and for the, for the one who connects us with the transcendence, that's the place to look at. Now, let's, let's see how, how, you know, just some little various historical data which may be interesting. Usually, and I tell you, I think it's going to be true in, uh, in uh, 
our uh, mo modern and postmodern world, usually when the, uh, the hier hieratic figure, the king, is uh, chased away, is no longer there. It the, 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 the monarchical, the kingly office reconstitutes itself. Look what happened in Rome. Well, the Romans initially had kings. It's not very well known. Uh, and then there was one king who was uh, not a very kingly king, I guess he uh, made people pretty mad, was Tarquinius Superbus. And so the Romans chased Tarquinius Superbus away. All right. So, yes. There was a king in Greece in 1974 that was voted out. Yeah. He yeah. just passed last month. Yeah, yeah. So that. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So, um, Vasilev, yes. yes. Uh, so, um, let's see, oh, yeah. so well, the Tarquinius Superbus was thrown out, and uh, what became a sort of an archetype in itself, the Roman Republic was constituted, which actually wasn't called that, but it was SPQR, Senatus Populis, Populusque Romanus, the Roman Senate and the Roman people. Uh, and, uh, okay, this, this went on for a while and did, did very well. But you know what? Then came Julius Caesar and he was murdered. And then very, the nephew of Julius Caesar became the first emperor. Now came the, came the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, imperator, which initially was really a, a military title, like a field marshal. But uh, so all of a sudden, there was a monarchy with much more, much, with much more power and much more glory than the old Roman kings ever had. So the thing is, these are, these are often cycles and uh, people, people get tired of trying to run their own show. Yeah. And uh, they'll say, okay, you know, let's get somebody who is nice and wise and qualified and hand it to him, you know. And so that is that is very, very much a possibility. But what is really behind all of this is something inside of us. Because we are a world. And uh, this world has its own uh, ways of functioning. And this world, at one time, when we were close to the divine, when our connection with the, with the transcendental realm was much more uh, intimate, when we were uh, being visited by the angels, and the transcendental powers every night. Wouldn't that be nice instead of having the stupid dreams that we have <laughs> so often? And so, you know, there, and there, is a, there is a far memory, there is a mysterious memory inside of us, you know, that there was a time when we were with the gods, when we, were, when we had our own Mount Olympus, when the gods and the goddesses, the transcendental beings, walked among humans. You know, even, uh, even in the Middle Ages, which would certainly include the period about the Arthurian myths, even in, the, even in those times, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, connection with the world that we don't, we don't believe in it now, and therefore it doesn't exist. Uh, the connection with that world was really intimate. And the angels, and for that matter the devils, they walked the earth. You know, you, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is German folklore. Uh, you know how you can tell uh, whether, uh, uh, whether you've seen the devil on the road? Because when he's in the sunshine, he uh, casts no shadow. 
and, and you know what kind of thing well because in modern terms we would say he casts no shadow because he is the shadow uh -huh. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's uh, also kind of interesting uh, in fact there is a, a famous uh, I think a medieval German wrong poem I couldn't think of it's not by one of the great uh, poets but it is called it's entitled Peter Schlemiel, the man on a shot. Peter Schlemiel, the man without a shadow. And what this is, there is this German guy, Peter. Uh, maybe he was a Schlemiel, that's why his name is Schlemiel. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Peter, Peter, Peter uh, was walking on the road and he ran into uh, the devil. Uh, you know, the devil was around, walking around. And so the devil persuaded Peter to sell him to the devil his shadow. Uh, Peter liked money. Uh, so uh, he said, well, Lord, what the heck? I, I, I don't see why, why I have to have a shadow, you know. So he got the price and all that. And then he found out as time went on, it's against a myth, as to how important his shadow really was to him. And finally he just made all kinds of uh, maneuvers to get hold of the devil again in order to buy back his, his shadow. And I think in the end he did so. Uh, and Peter Schlemiel, the man on a shutton, the man without a shadow. So, uh, so you could encounter all kinds of uh, spirits that way and people People didn't bat an eye, you know. Well, well, of course, you know, just like uh, in some places, including to a great extent where I grew up or my family, uh, nobody bat an eye if uh, somebody who supposed to have died appeared. Well, of course, what, what do you expect, you know? And, and some of it was, was really kind of funny. And I don't know whether, I, uh, whether this sounds like a, a kind of bragging or a, a telling of tall tales, but for, these are the kind of things that went on all the time. For instance, uh, my father had a friend who was a pipe smoker. My father smoked a cigar when he could get it. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, so then this, this gentleman died. I vaguely remember him. I think I saw him once or twice visiting. So uh, here we were. I mean, we went to his funeral, uh, requiem mass and all that. And then a few days later, or maybe even a few weeks later, we were in the house. In particular, my father, who was very sensitive, said, can you smell anything unusual? And I said, yes, Papa, it's the tobacco that Uncle John so-and-so used to smoke. Yes, he says, so, because he's around. And he signalized with the tobacco, uh, the burning tobacco smoke. And I was just in seventh heaven because I like those things. And said, ah, we have, a, we have a ghost who smokes a pipe. <laughs> you know, that, that this is really great. You know? um, and uh, it, it's in, in some countries and in, in some historical periods, uh, the, the dividing, uh, the divisions between the worlds, world of the living, world of the dead, world of the angels, world of the demons, whatever you want to call it, was not so divided. And you, it, you know, when it comes right, again, uh, we might say that uh, it made life more interesting. Now we substitute for it with television and the computers and all of that. You know what, I would, I would much rather see, see a bunch of angels uh, dancing on the on the tip of a needle, as the, as the uh, theologians said in the Middle Ages, then uh, all the, uh, the goofy stuff that comes to us uh, by way of the media. And, you know, it, it actually, I mean, this is an incredibly, I'm, I'm now talking rather in a personal fashion, you can tell, 
uh, it is really a, this, uh, this world that we live in, the physical part of it is very small, very small. The rest of it is all non-physical. So it's full of spirits, it's full of angels, it's also some, some nasty angels, but, but it, uh, it has a vast population of essentially interesting and informative beings. And many of them are quite uh, capable and eager to uh, communicate with us. So when you, when you see some of them, or in some way you become aware of them, fear is, uh, not, uh, uh, fear is not really indicated. There's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, these are beings like yourself. You're not afraid of the little dogs that people walk around here. Well, maybe every once in a while there is a great big kujo, you know, <laughs> and maybe you might want to be afraid of him. But on the whole, not. So uh, this is really a, a, a much more lively, a much more interesting world than you think. But we have gotten to the point where for some doggone reason we uh, moved our consciousness out of uh, these, these uh, realms which are ordinarily not visible to us but which are nevertheless there and which are trying to contact us and we might as well contact them. And so then uh, what we have done, mythologically speaking, in terms of the Arthurian myth, for instance, we have killed the king, we have killed Arthur, and we have sent him off to uh, Avalon, but he's going to come back. And the theme, incidentally, of the once and future king is one that returns in imaginative, inspired literature again and again. Uh, I am also, as I, you, some of you may have divined over a period of time, I am also very fond of a great modern mythmaker, J.R.R. Tolkien, John Ronald Revel Tolkien. Uh, and uh, um, if you read the uh, trilogy uh, um, and the perhaps with the introductory volume, The Hobbit, carefully, you see that, uh, for instance, that these archetypal themes, in this case, the return of the king, the return of the once, the once and future king, runs all through Tolkien. But there are so many things that go on in Tolkien's books, of course, that it's easy to miss. So when I first read Tolkien, um, the, the first one I read was The Hobbit, uh, and uh, I, ever since then, I was just really enthralled. There's just no doubt about it. Now, let me see. Where are we here? I thought I had put some markers in here. But, for instance, you, you, just to indicate, I mean, the, the introductory uh, volume to The Lord of the Rings, uh, The Hobbit, is, is a much more simple uh, 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 work, but in it also the, the great uh, uh, theme of a king who was here once and who no longer is and who has to come back. The once and future king keeps returning. You know, in the, uh, the, the Hobbit, the introductory volume, uh, is to a large extent uh, composed of the story of the, the dwarves, little fellows with big beards and who live on the, in caves in and uh, looking for gold and jewels in the mountains. And their, their belief is that uh, there was a time when their king, whom they called the king under the mountain, was there and had ruled his kingdom, the kingdom of, of all the all the gold, of, of, with all the jewels and so forth. And uh, for instance, here is the, 
little little poetic description of that uh, song that the, uh, the, the, the dwarf sing. The king beneath the mountains, the king of carven stone, the lord of silver fountains shall come into his own. The king is going to come back. His crown shall be upholden. His harp shall be restrung. His horse shall echo golden to songs of your re-sung. The woods shall waver, wave on mountains and grass beneath the sun. His wealth shall flow in fountains and the rivers golden run. The stream shall run in gladness. The lakes shall shine and burn and so and sorrow fail and sadness at the mountain king's return. So that, you know, these are the... Someday I'll, I'll do another few lectures on the Lord of the Rings, but uh, I have in the past, and the, uh, uh, actually the, the main races of uh, beings in the Lord of the Rings, they are, they are organized somewhat according to the four... Uh, elements and the, the dwarves are the element of earth, and then the the elves are the element of air, and so forth. But uh, uh, so you can see that uh, all different beings want the return of a mysterious king, who is not there but whom they knew once and who had gone away. And of course, at the human level, when you come to the Lord of the Rings, you have the, the heir of the ancient kings, Aragorn, son of Aragorn, who uh, eventually comes back and he becomes the king of, the, of, of both kingdoms. Because in, in the prediction about him that uh, the crownless shall again be king. So... Uh, it's a, it's a universal archetypal theme that there is something missing. And what is missing is uh, a good, wise, and kindly, and holy, actually, you might say, archetypal uh, direction to human life and to human society. But once again, you say, well, what are we going to do? Are we, uh, are we going to, like the, some of those dumbbells did a couple of years ago, are we going to storm the houses of Congress and, and uh, install somebody from California as king? It would be kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> but uh, obviously that is, that is not uh, what, what we are doing. But we, we, need to, uh, we need to restore the spiritual connection we need to have the crowned one within ourselves and have him come to life. We need to bring King Arthur back from the Isle of Avalon. And of course, you know, we have our own Avalon on Catalina Island. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then things are better. So what, it, what is really meant that we, uh, we need to restore um, our connection with the, the transcendental realm, with the other world, and restore it in such a way that it becomes our, uh, our king, our, our guiding light. Uh, so, and and uh, our, uh, uh, our direct, uh, directing influence in our lives, as indeed the uh, wise and good kings who really were in, in the majority when it comes right down to it in history. Uh, you know where the, where the trouble, if you want a little historical uh, uh, rumination here, and if you don't want it, I'll still give it to you. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, uh, where the uh, monarchies, the European monarchies got into trouble. They got into trouble in the 18th century with absolutism, when people like Louis XIV and so forth, because absolute power does not belong to anybody. 
we all, and that the whole mythos of, of uh, the kings was that they were using the, the mission, the power, the position that they received from God, that they were by the, by the grace of God. And uh, once again, if we translate these things in contemporary terms in, into, our, uh, into our own situation, now what does that mean? It means that we, whatever we may be doing, whatever talents we may have, whatever, and you know, talent in olden days was a sum of money. You know, so many talents, a talentum. Uh, but uh, uh, whatever we may have, we have it. Uh, we have it on loan uh, from the king, uh, and uh, he's, he's not going to ask us to to pay uh, pay him a lot of interest on it. Uh, but we, uh, in other words, uh, if we are smart. If we are young, which is certainly not the case with me anymore, not the way of you know. If we are, if we are young, if we are beautiful, if we are, we, we have various good points, so to say. These are all uh, given to us by a higher power. You know, not it's not sui generis. It's not that we we make them happen, but we can. Our job is to be receptive. Our job is to be open-minded and open-hearted to the greater world. And then the, the king, the, uh, the gift of the king, the, 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 uh, the treasure of the king will come to us and we will become good ad ad administrator of it. And we will be, con this is the whole thing, we will be connected with a vast and marvelous reality on which there are, as, as, as the New Testament says, Jesus says in the New Testament, in my father's house there are many mansions. You know, because there are many levels, there are many worlds, and each one of these worlds is royal in nature. It's beautiful. It, is, it, is, it manifests transcendental power. And if we are affinitized to it, then we will uh, profit from that spiritually to a very great extent. And uh, it's very, very important. Uh, and, and also to recognize that the, the problem is with, the, with materialism, whether it is uh, uh, philosophical or uh, political or otherwise, that it is too limited. Why limit reality to this, uh, at best, ambivalent and at worst, really kind of painful and dirty world? There is so much more than that, so much more than that. And in it there is uh, wisdom, there is goodness, there is kindness, there is, uh, there is that which transcends everything uh, lower than itself. So we, uh, we live really in the middle of a very, uh, uh, very promising world. There is a great promise here. And the promise is not a promise of technology. And it's not a promise of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Listen, there is too little, too little human intelligence around. It's mostly human stupidity, you know. Uh, so uh, artificial, do we need artificial on top of that? Uh -huh. uh, I don't think so. But uh, intelligence, yes. And if we are affinitized to it, then it really can be a, it can be a very interesting, a very exciting, uh, a, a very promising world. And so here is, this, this is, to me at least, this is the great promise and revelation that the, the once and future king, once there was a reality apparent, in our lives, in the life of the world, and difficulties have arisen, 
And it's not so evident now, and maybe it has gone away, but it shall come again. This is, whether you call it the second coming, whether you call it the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Maitri of Buddha, uh, the Buddha of the, of, uh, the future age, whatever, but he, there is a, uh, a royal and sacred and good and kindly and wise presence that is able to return, that will return. But we have to be there to uh, facilitate that return and to, uh, uh, to uh, make, it, make it happen by facilitating it. Because we are the uh, carriers of uh, the round table. We are the carriers of, of Arthur. It is inside of us that Arthur waits to arise and to come back and take over his king kingdom again. So we are, uh, we are important people who carry a great promise. We will bring back into manifestation, into his rule and into his reign, the the once and future king, the spiritual king who reigned before, whom we could see thousands and millions of years ago and whom we can see again. So that is sort of the, the archetypal, the transcendental spiritual background of the idea of the once and future king. And if indeed uh, all goes well and we are able to uh, come together, we will continue with that theme and, and some of the details of the Arthurian legend as to how they manifest this uh, particular reality. Oh my goodness, here I, I, once again I spoke longer than I intended to. In any event, uh, try to keep that in mind because the, these are the realities that underlie history. These are the realities that underlie the myths that underlie the stories. There is something extremely real at the foundation of all of this, but we have to discover it, we have to brush it off, we have to free it from accretions, and then I think we are dealing with a very, very great, a very wonderful and a very promising reality. So um, uh, you pardon me for having been perhaps a little bit uh, 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 woozy today because I am at the end of a very difficult week. I was involved in a very great deal of pain. But don't you worry, Arthur is coming back and we will be there. And, and in that manner and in that fashion, long live the king. <laughs> <laughs>